name is Megan Collins and I am the research coordinator for Kiergren Foundation. And today we are welcomed by several researchers um, who study grin disorders and greed disorders at large. And first today, let's see, do we have Dr. Ramsey on the call yet? Okay, so it looks like Dr. Ramsey isn't yet with us, but we'll go ahead and get started with Dr. Marta Vieira, who is a postdoc in the lab of Dr. Catherine Roche at the NIH. Okay, thank you so much, Megan. Um, can you confirm that my microphone is working well? Yes, you yes. sound great. Okay, okay good. Okay, sorry about that. Let me just get this timer started <laughs> to avoid going over time. So thank you so much for uh, having me here today to present uh, my, the work that I've been doing in Dr. Catherine Roche's lab at NIH on um, an MDA receptor subunit phosphorylation and um, how a rare variant of a subunit, um, a rare variant of a phosphorylation site affects uh, receptor function. So um, neuronal uh, NMDA receptors are very important for both brain as well as neuronal development and function, namely in the processes involved in the in neuronal communication or neurotransmission. And those uh, events that underlie neuronal communication occur in the specialized structures over here, as you can see, that each neuron has uh, called dendrites and in their axon terminals. So if you zoom in into the contact between two neurons, you have a structure like this in which you have a presynaptic neuron, the neuron that has a message to communicate to the following neuron, and the postsynaptic neuron, which will be able to initiate, uh, continue, uh, propagate the response to that message. So that message is initiated by synaptic vesicles that are present in the presynaptic neuron that release that uh, the neurotransmitter they contain into the, the space between the two neurons called uh, synaptic cleft. And once the neurotransmitter is present uh, in the synaptic cleft, it can be recognized by receptors that are localized in the postsynaptic membrane. So, um, for NMDA receptors, they recognize the neurotransmitter glutamate, but there are other uh, types of glutamate receptors, of course, AMPA and kinate being the most obvious. Um, and so everything I'm going to talk about has to do with what happens in the receptor when they're localized in this um, uh, portion of the synapse, uh, which is the postsynaptic, in the postsynaptic neuron, but in the structure that we call a spine, which is a uh, um, a structure that occurs in, um, in the dendrites of postsynaptic neurons. So NMDA receptors are encoded by GRIN genes that I'm sure you're all familiar with, and uh, they um, are composed of uh, four subunits. So each NMDA receptor has four subunits, two of which are always GUN1, and uh, they can assemble with different combinations of GUN2 or GUN3 subunits. In our lab, we're particularly focused on GLUN2A and GLUN2B, uh, which are encoded by GRIN2A and GRIN2B. But today, uh, the work that I'm gonna show you today is related to GLUN2A specifically. So um, besides being interested in these two subunits in particular, we're actually interested in this portion of, this, of uh, GLUN2A and GLUN2B subunits, the C-terminal domain or CTD. So this region is um, localized intracellularly when the receptor is inserted into the membrane. So as you can see, there's this extracellular portion where glutamate can bind and activate the receptor. There are some transmembrane domains that um, are um, cross the membrane. Um, and then there's this intracellular C-terminal domain. And we're interested in this region because it is involved in uh, the regulation um, of processes of uh, receptor trafficking. So uh, these uh, actually involves uh, several steps and there are several types of events uh, that can occur to regulate the number and the localization of the receptor at the membrane. So um, not only the trafficking itself, but also the insertion as well as the removal of the receptors is tightly regulated. <clears throat> 
Um, and then once in the membrane, the receptors can move laterally to be localized in this uh, structure I mentioned before, the spine, and in this um, you know, highly uh, dense, um, protein-dense region called the postsynaptic density. And this is the postsynaptic component of the synapse. So this, um, the CTD actually exerts its effects, its modulatory effects, by, um, by its ability to interact with different proteins. Uh, for example, trafficking proteins that regulate these process, this transportation from um, the cytosol to the membrane. For example, Sorinexin 27, I will tell you a little more about that protein later on. This protein is important for um, increasing the targeting of receptors to the membrane. Uh, but also in the postsynaptic density, the receptor interacts with many proteins, namely PSC95, which stabilizes the receptor there. Um, the other way in which receptors can, um, the CTD can uh, exert a modulatory role on NMDA receptors is via post-translational modifications. We're particularly interested in phosphorylation, which is an event in which um, a kinase will add a phosphate group to its substrate, in this case, an MPA receptor subunit. And what we know is that this is a very dynamic process that can occur in only subsets of the protein um, in specific regions of the cell or um, uh, you know, in a specific time in response to specific insults or, um, sorry, stimuli. And um, phosphorylation is very dynamic, as I mentioned, and it can lead to uh, changes in terms of receptor localization, receptor activity, and its ability to interact with uh, uh, other proteins. So all those things contribute to change uh, the number of receptors that are present at the postsynaptic density, and that can influence the extent of NMDA receptor activity in a response to glutamate release. So over the years, people have been interested in the study of phosphorylation of NMDA receptor subunits, naming one, namely GUN2A and GUN2B. Uh, and these are some that were already studied and characterized. And today I'm going to tell you about a work that we did recently in which we found uh, an, a new site uh, on GUN2A, serine 1459, that we found to be phosphorylated by CAMK2. So uh, when doing studies of phosphorylation of a protein, it's important to both uh, identify the kinase and also to figure out whether uh, that phosphorylation site is relevant in the context of the cell. And so uh, to do that, we need uh, appropriate tools. And so one of the tools that's important for phosphorylation studies is um, our uh, antibodies that will be able to recognize a protein only when it's in its phosphorylated state, which we developed one and uh, it worked out pretty well, actually. And so we, we first tried to identify the kinase that mediates this phosphorylation. We found that we tested several different kinases, and we found that ChemK2 is the one that uh, gives us a very robust signal for phosphorylation. And we also found that this is a, a phosphorylation site that is occurring in neurons. Um, since we were able to detect a strong phosphorylation signal for GLUN2A um, when we performed subcellular fractionation of uh, mouse brains. And importantly, we also found that this is actually a mechanism that is regulated by activity. So we performed an in vivo um, activity paradigm in mice. And what we found was that when we induce activity, we see an increase in the level of uh, phosphorylated GLUN2A, suggesting that it's the activity, the stimulus that leads to um, phosphorylation. Um, next, we also wanted to know whether this addition of a phosphate group in this residue over here, this is the residue we were studying, would interfere with binding of other proteins to this motif. This is the so-called PDZ binding motif, which is very close to our uh, phosphorylation site. So we wanted to know if um, interaction with specific proteins would be altered. So we looked into two important proteins, PSC95, which, as I mentioned, stabilizes the receptor in the postsynaptic density. We found that this interaction is decreased by phosphorylation of serine 1459. However, when we tested the interaction with serine nexin 27, we saw the opposite effect. So we actually see a significant increase in the interaction with serine nexin. 
And um, if you remember, I mentioned that surinexin is a trafficking protein. So it binds the receptor when it's uh, in endosomes uh, inside the cell, and it promotes its trafficking to the postsynaptic density, suggesting that by increasing the interaction, we're increasing the delivery of receptors to the surface. And to test that, we actually did, we transfected neurons uh, with uh, different mutants of this phosphorylation. And then we looked at the surface expression of the receptor. We found that if we prevent the receptor from being phosphorylated in the site, we actually see a significant decrease. As you can see here in the quantification, we see a significant decrease in the surface expression of co 2 a And interestingly, we also found a significant decrease, uh, a corresponding decrease in the, the spine density. So this suggests that uh, this decrease uh, that we see over here um, of uh, went away at the surface leads to decreased neuronal activity. So having found a significant uh, physiological relevant um, effect for phosphorylation of serine 1459, we wondered what would happen if we had a patient that um, actually cannot have phosphorylation in this particular site. And we actually found one that was publicly available at ClinVar and had been previously published in this paper. And we found that uh, the patient uh, has, instead of a serine in this site, it has in this position, it has a glycine. And glycine cannot be phosphorylated. So we knew that the phosphorylation, uh, the modulation exerted by the phosphorylation would be um, disrupted in this case. And we actually um, also were you know, uh, convinced that this would be a damaging uh, variant since we, we know that this is a highly conserved residue, so it suggests that there's evolutionary conservation of the site. So to test whether uh, the glycine mutant would lead to dysfunction of the receptor, we tested the same parameters that we had seen were modulated by the phosphorylation. So we looked at the interactions with uh, PSC95, again, uh, this is decreased. However, the interaction with Surinexin 27, the trafficking protein was also significantly decreased, suggesting that uh, both trafficking as well as stabilization of the receptor in the postsynaptic density uh, might be affected. Um, next, uh, we wanted to know whether this would um, uh, correspond to a decrease in the surface expression of the receptor. We actually found that uh, we see a, a small but significant decrease in the levels of went away uh, for the mutant uh, when expressed in neurons, suggesting that, again, there is a decrease in NMDA receptor-mediated activity due to this, this decrease in NMDA receptor numbers. And accordingly, we actually found also a decrease in the spine density um, occurring in these neurons and neurons expressing this mutant, suggesting again that there is a decrease in the number of functional synapses uh, in neurons expressing our mutant. And this is actually corroborated by an effect that we observed when we measured mini PSCs um, in these neurons, uh, which show a significant degrees in terms of frequency, which again um, suggests that there is a decrease in um, the, the number of functional synapses. So overall, what I've just uh, been telling you about uh, points to a significant physiological role of a phosphorylation that is mediated by CAMK2, which I didn't mention, sorry about that, but CAMK2 is a very a highly um, abundant protein that occurs in the postsynaptic density and has known roles in terms of synaptic plasticity and neuronal activity. So it's a very relevant kinase in this context. And what we found was that uh, CAMK2 phosphorylates go into A, and that leads to uh, changes or modulation of receptor trafficking. However, if we have instead of a serine in this position, we have a disruption of uh, the trafficking due to impaired binding to uh, proteins are important for receptor function. And this results in a reduction in the surface uh, the receptor expression and, um, and also the, the a decrease in spine density, suggesting overall uh, a loss of function for uh, the glycine mutant identified in the, in the epilepsy patient. So this is just to illustrate how uh, physiologically relevant uh, mechanisms such as phosphorylation can uh, be disrupted in a um, 
a patient. So just to finalize very quickly, uh, I think I'm still on time. Um, I would just like to thank everyone uh, in the Roche lab, uh, current and past members, and specifically, of course, Dr. Roche, um, our collaborators, and for funding, I'd like to thank NIH and the Portuguese Foundation for Science and Technology. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Vieira. Now I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Chad from uh, Dr. Trinellis' lab. Go ahead and take it away, Chad. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Let me get all of this out of the way. Okay, so I am Chad Camp. I'm a senior graduate student at Emory in Steve Trinellis' lab. Uh, and today I'm gonna to talk to you guys about the NMG receptor and parvalbumin interneurons. Uh, this is just a picture of the Emory quad, uh, and then uh, our disclosures are listed below. Uh, so to reorient everybody, although Marta did a great job doing this, I want to talk a little bit about synaptic transmission. Uh, so here in blue is a neuron, and then all of these orange lines are presynaptic axon terminals. If we zoom in a little bit, we can see the orange presynaptic cell and the blue postsynaptic cell. Um, <clears throat> separated by this tiny gap called a synaptic cleft. Uh, the presynaptic cell releases a neurotransmitter, it diffuses across the cleft and binds to postsynaptic receptors. Uh, when we're talking about ionotropic glutamate receptors, uh, we can record these postsynaptic responses as current. Um, most ionotropic glutamate currents can be broken down into two different uh, categories. We have this really fast AMPA-mediated component, component here in the gray and a slower um, calcium permeable NMGA mediated current. And I'm gonna to talk to you guys about NMGA uh, receptors today. Um, so NMGA receptors are very important for normal brain function. Um, and when they're mutated, there's a host of neuropathological diseases that can uh, be attributed to these variants. Uh, so over here in this table on the left, these are all of the genes encoding various subunits of the NMGA receptor. Uh, and then some of the um, more common neuropathological diseases. Uh, for this talk, I'm gonna focus on gluin2A. So when we're looking at gluin2A, uh, we can see that gluin2A variants account for almost 50% of all NMG receptor variants. Uh, it's highly associated with intellectual disability and epilepsy. And when we kind of stratify these variants into their subtypes, we can see that nearly one third are protein disrupting. Uh, so these would be variants that are nonsense or maybe a chromosomal deletion. We can further stratify these variants <clears throat> um, into three other categories. Uh, so null would be variants that um, would be the protein disrupting, no functional protein is going to be made. Uh, loss of function, meaning that it performs worse than a normal receptor would. Um, and then the gain of function, meaning that it outperforms a normal receptor. So when we look at human data um, from the GRIN portal, we can see that all three subtypes have a seizure onset rate of around three to five years of age. Uh, the really interesting thing is when we look at these null variants that aren't making any functional protein, they have a seizure offset, off, offset rate um, around 12 that we don't really see with these loss of function variants and the gain of function variants. Uh, so our lab was really interested in why. Uh, so to do this, we're using a grin to a knockout mouse. Uh, so we're thinking that this could be a good model for these null variants and that the grin to a knockout mice also don't have any functional glue into a protein. The first thing that we wanted to do was to see if these mice had a seizure phenotype. Uh, so we en enlisted a paradigm called a febrile seizure. So we inject LPS to mimic a bacterial infection, let that sit for around two hours and then heat the mice up to um, recapitulate a fever. Over here on the right in the red, you can see that around 75% of the grin 2 a knockout mice have limb clonus compared to around 40% of age match wild type controls. Um, and again, we're seeing around 75% of the grin 2 a knockout mice having generalized tonic clonic seizures, whereas only around 20% of wild types do. Uh, so all of this to say the, the grin 2 a knockout mice is showing some signs of neonatal uh, hyperactivity, and as well as induced seizure activity. So next, uh, now that we have validated this model as a potential use for null variant study, uh, we wanted to dig deeper into the molecular mechanism that's causing this excitability. Uh, 
To do that, we enlisted the help of um, my favorite brain region, the hippocampus. This is a fantastic model brain region because it holds up really well in slice preparation and we understand its circuitry very well. So the first thing that I did was I went and patched a CA1 pyramidal cell and then stimulated the Schaefer collaterals um, in rapid succession for uh, five stimulations. So I'm getting neurotransmitter released onto my CA1 pyramidal cell and then I can record and current clamp um, action potential. So glutamate receptors are gonna cause cells to depolarize and you can record action potential uh, probability. So looking here over on the right, you can see that um, the grin 2 a knockout mice have a higher action potential spiking probability compared to the wild type mice after five rapid successions of Schaefer collateral stimulation, um, suggesting that these mice have a hyperexcitable synaptic phenotype. One potential um, <clears throat> explanation to why we are seeing this phenotype is that there's something wrong with the interneuron population. So interneurons are a vast uh, group of cells that are control uh, how these pyramidal cells fire by releasing GABA, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, uh, and then dampening the ability for them to reach action potential threshold. Um, so the first thing we did was to record spontaneous inhibitory events onto these CE1 pyramidal cells. And then looking at this graph on the right, you can see that the inner event interval or the time in between each uh, inhibitory event is shifted to the right, meaning that uh, the grin 2 a knockout mice have a higher probability of less events per unit time. So in hippocampus, there's probably 20 different subtypes of interneuron, um, but the main ones that we focused on um, are these so-called basket cells, and there's two subtypes of basket cell. Uh, there's a PV expressing basket cell or parvalbumin expressing, and then there's a CCK expressing or cholecystokinin expressing. First thing we wanted to do was to just look at overall counts um, because NMDA receptors mediate calcium flow into the cell, uh, changes in calcium flux during early development could change interneuron infiltration and or apoptosis. So we counted cell density in the CA1 area, and you can see in pre-adolescent mice and in adult mice that there is this significant increase in CA1 PV cell density. However, when we perform this same staining technique to look at the counterpart for the PV cells, the CCK expressing cells, we see there is no difference in the overall cell density at either age. So these data would suggest that perhaps the PV cells are more vulnerable to the loss of gluin 2A signaling. The next thing that we wanted to do was to look at how these PV cells would be functioning. Um, and there's multiple ways we can do that, but we chose to focus on passive electrical properties first. Uh, to do that, we enlisted the use of a transgenic reporter mouse line. Um, so this expresses a fluorescent protein underneath the PV promoter, and then I took these mice and bred in the uh, grin 2 a knockout line. So that way in a slice, I can see which are the PV cells. Uh, first thing uh, you can see looking at this graph here in the middle is there's no change in the resting membrane potential at either age. There's also no change in the capacitance of these cells at either age. However, when we look at the input resistance, we can see there's a transient increase in the pre-adolescent grin 2 a knockout PV cells that then becomes corrected when the cells reach adulthood. So all of this to say that the grin 2 a knockout cells appear to be more excitable because an increase of your input resistance means that any incoming charge that the cell sees, it's going to hold onto it longer and you're going to get a bigger voltage deflection in response to the same current injection. So this doesn't really make sense along with our story. However, when we look at action potential firing properties or the ability for these PV cells to transmit their signals down the line to other cells, uh, we see a pretty big change in their overall um, ability to fire. First thing we noticed was that the action potential half width or how long the action potential is in time uh, is transiently increased in these pre-adolescent mice that then returns back to wild type levels in adulthood. We also noticed that the uh, current required for the cell to reach depolarization induced block uh, was transiently decreased in pre-adolescent mice that then again becomes corrected in adulthood. Uh, so this PV cells are very unique in that they fire action potentials very rapidly, sometimes up to uh, 150 Hertz or around 300 events per second. Um, and once these cells reach a certain current injection, they stop firing action potentials uh, and they reach this depolarized, depolarized state uh, 
uh, but it's no longer transmitting um, the signal down the line. And you can see that all of these cells, except for the preadolescent grin to a knockout cell, can withstand current injections of over 1,000 picoamps, whereas the grin to a knockout cell kind of peters out around 750. We also noticed that the grin to a knockout cells, at least in the preadolescent mice, um, had an overall decrease in their firing frequency. Uh, so again, looking at these uh, traces, the, the reason why all of these are so black is because there's so many events per unit time that they kind of bleed together. Whereas in the grin to a knockout mice, you can clearly see delineations of each action potential event. So these data combined with the uh, input resistance means that these cells have a really unique phenotype and that they're fast to uh, reach action potential threshold, but then they kind of uh, stop firing. And then they, so they're fast to fire and fast to retire. Um, and all of these changes could have profound impact on the network, especially during this pre-adolescent neurodevelopmental period. So to summarize everything that I've shown you uh, so far, so we have the GRIN2A uh, null variants, meaning that they don't make any functional protein. Um, they have a pretty profound seizure burden. Um, something happens um, in a really good way. And then they are no longer, or at least most of them no longer have this seizure burden around 12 years of age. Looking at the GRIN2A knockout mice that we're trying to use to recapitulate this null, these null variants, um, from birth around P15, they are susceptible to febrile seizures. We see this increase in synaptic excitability. They age for maybe another week or so, and then we assayed the excitatory to inhibitory balance when that was shifted towards decreased inhibition. We also saw an increase of PV cells. However, they were overall dampened in their ability to transmit signal. Then the animal ages into adulthood, PV cell excitability is restored, and we have no reported seizure activity. Um, so some key questions in future directions that uh, our lab has after we've completed these studies is, how does the loss of gluin 2 a signaling control early interneuron infiltration and apoptosis? And more specifically, how early did these gluin 2 a mediated signaling events begin? Usually when we think about gluin 2 a we're very familiar with the gluin 2 a to gluin 2 b switch. Um, and this usually happens around P14. However, interneuron infiltration and apoptosis happens way earlier than that. So this would suggest that gluin 2 a signaling events, at least in PV cells, uh, may be important as early as P0. Um, could this be a possible blueprint for what's happening with loss of function missense variants? Um, and then I think the most important question this um, study brings up is what's the most optimal time window in which we should intervene, potentially with um, circuit correcting genetic uh, therapeutics. Um, so all of our funding is listed here. I'd like to thank everybody in the Trainellis lab, along with my collaborators at NIH. Uh, they've been very instrumental in helping me understand the crazy world of interneurons, uh, as well as thanking my committee members and uh, mentors and colleagues. Um, and that's all I've got. Thanks. Thank you, Chad. It looks like Amy has joined us now. So I'll pass it over to Dr. Amy Ramsey, who is at the University of Toronto. My apologies, everyone, for um, missing the beginning of the session. I uh, had some technical problems. Thank you for your patience. Let me get my screen up. Uh, to share with you. Can everyone see this? Great. Yes? Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to be talking about visual deficits and how this influences um, behaviors in our grin mouse models. I want to start off by acknowledging um, the many great members of my lab. In particular, I want to highlight Tatiana Lapina, who is a research associate in the lab. And um, really, this work was all her idea and her um, you know, execution. So I am, I am honestly presenting Tatiana's brainchild here. Um, and the, the um, reason that we started looking at the visual system is that we you know, have heard from many uh, parents and clinicians that a common symptom for uh, GRIN patients and for some other GRI patients as well, we've heard for uh, GRIA um, also, there are cortical visual impairments. And so we wanted to know 
um, for this mouse that we've worked with for um, over 20 years, are there visual um, deficits? And how might this influence some of the other behaviors that we normally look at, like learning and memory and fear? Um, so uh, we, we went and, and did a simple test for vision, and this is called the visual clip. And what you can see is um, that there is a clear box and part of the box is resting on the surface of a table. And the other half of the box is hanging over the table. And we use this checkerboard to help the mice see uh, the difference between the table and the drop. And even though there is this plastic box, the mouse will not go onto the visual cliff and they spend most of their time in the safe area, which you know, would be this part here, the percentage of time that they spend in each area, a wild type mouse will spend over 80% of their time in the, the safe area and only 20% in the cliff. Wow, the GRIN1 knockdown mice that have very low levels of NMDA receptors really don't make a, distinguish, a, a distinction between these two um, areas. So this would indicate that they have visual deficits. And at this point, we haven't done anything else to characterize their visual system. Um, so you know, with this very basic, uh, simple test, we are operating under the conclusion that there are likely visual deficits in the knockdown animals. And so this is an important phenotype for the children um, that we can now model in the mice as well. And then Tatiana said, well, you know, there are some memory tests that use visual cues. And one that comes immediately to mind is the Morris water maze. And here you put a mouse in a, a big tank of water and there's a hidden platform somewhere in the water. And the mouse uses visual cues that are placed on the wall next to the tank. And based on the location of these cues, they can figure out where that hidden platform is. So that when you are training the animal, it might take them 20 seconds at first, but um, when the platform is visible and then um, they very quickly learn where that platform is. And when we do this with the knockdown mice, they take longer and they don't seem to learn where that platform is. So then when we test them um, after a week of training, we take away the platform and see where they spend their time looking for that platform. And you can see in the wild type animal that they spend the majority of their time in the quadrant of the pool where that hidden platform was located, where they learned to go. And they don't spend a lot of their time searching in other quadrants. And the mutant mice really don't have any preference um, for the targeted area. So they don't seem to have any memory of where that platform was. This all makes sense. But then Tatiana said, hmm, if they're having visual problems, maybe what we need to do is bring these visual clues much closer to them. And that's exactly what she did. So she modified this test. Um, and put the same visual cues right on the wall of the pool. And when she did the training, the wild type mice looked very similar. The mutant mice, maybe they started to learn, but really they, they were still spending a lot of time swimming. But then when she did the test, you know, after they had been trained for a week, um, she saw that not only did the wild type mice spend most of their time in that quadrant, but the knockdown mice did too. So they knew where that quadrant would be and they're definitely, they, they did learn the location and they do remember the location. And so really what this test was telling us is there is not a deficit in their memory of the location. It's just that we were using a test that was too difficult for them because they couldn't see the visual cues to orient themselves. And, and then when we saw this dramatic difference, we realized, oh, we should probably go back and test some other behaviors. 
And so the first one that um, she did was this puzzle box test. And this is one where the mouse is put in this open arena and there's a, a small doorway and a small underpass that they need to go through in order to reach their goal box. And so the first test, the door is open and there's a four centimeter um, doorway. Then on test two through four, the doorway is closed and they need to use the underpass. And then in the later tests, we fill it with bedding. So then they need to do some digging behaviors. And you can see that the knockdown mice really don't do very well in these tests. But then when um, Tatiana modified it, she increased the height of the door and she increased the width of the door. So now the mouse can really see where it's going and it's not going to be touching any walls. Now the, the knockdown mice look a lot more like the wild type mice. And when we gave them just a kind of a two centimeter uh, taller ceiling, they went through the underpass very easily. So they certainly could solve this problem. They just needed a slightly larger space to go through. And when you close the door, it does take them longer. But if we compare this to the performance that they had before with the closed door here, um, they're definitely performing much better once they have the idea. So by modifying the test, they were, we were able to um, see improvements in their cognitive behavior. Um, now this bedding still provided a challenge for them. And, and we learned in other tests that the mice actually do not like to dig in bedding at all. And so there are probably um, some tactile sensory changes in these animals as well as visual changes. Um, so the reason why they are performing poorly on this test probably has more to do with sensory issues like vision and tactile sensation than it does in their ability to solve the problem and their strategy to reach that um, goal box. And finally, she did a very interesting test that I, I was impressed that she, she came up with this strategy, actually. Um, there's something that we use to measure anxiety, and it's called it the elevated plus maze or, you know, the EPM. And you have here catwalk, which is elevated up, and it's, it's just a narrow strip um, you know, that's it's elevated up above the floor. And then on the other side of this maze, you have uh, walls that would keep that animal safe. And usually a wild type mouse will spend all of their time in the closed arm and they spend very little time out in the open. And, you know, this is what a mouse should do since it is a prey animal, it shouldn't want to go out in the open. But what we see with the knockdown animals, and, you know, we've seen this for many years we've known this and it's also seen in several mouse models of autism where the mice spend most of their time out in the open and one might interpret this as uh, indicating that they're really not afraid of being out in the open and maybe they have an inappropriate um, loss of fear which of course is not you know necessarily a good thing for a mouse or a human. Um, but then, you know, this is where I think she did something really interesting. She used a larger maze, and this is one that's used to test rats. She cleaned it off and then let the mice explore. And now what you see is that the, um, now the wild type mice are more willing to go out in the open because that catwalk is uh, wider. But what you also see is now the knockdown mice are spending more of their time in the closed arms than they are in the open arms. So this would suggest that it's really not so much that they enjoy being out in the open, but that for the mouse EPM, um, it was too close for them. So either it was too dark or those walls were touching on their whiskers and they did not like that sensation, but they were avoiding um, the closed arm more than they were enjoying the open arm.
And, um, it, you know, it makes me think of, of uh, this example that, that someone once showed me, which is, you know, we can observe this mouse running, you know, in the same way that, that you observe your children performing a certain behavior. And we, we can't ask the mouse, why is it running? Um, in the same way, you don't always know why your child might be exhibiting a certain behavior. And it might be because they are moving towards something, or it might be that they are moving away from something. And so, you know, when we looked at the uh, elevated plus maze data, we thought that they were moving towards the open arm, but instead they were running away from the closed arm. And, and I just think that this is a, a really great example of how we can misinterpret the data if we don't take into account some of the sensory issues that these animals have. And, and sensory issues have been highlighted as, as really a core feature of autism. And it's, it's commonly seen in, in people who have the GRI disorder and in other uh, you know, forms of, of, um, of autism. And so uh, I think that, that you know, the take home message is that arena modifications may be necessary for mouse models that have sensory deficits and, and really characterizing those sensory um, components is, is very important. Um, and I think in terms of translation for uh, GRI patients, improving uh, the sensory system, either vision or somatosensation or hearing is likely to improve other aspects um, that you know, we would attribute to cognition, but part of cognition is receiving good sensory information. So I think that it is uh, an important endpoint to consider um, when we're thinking about therapies for, for children or adults who have grin disorders or GRI disorders. And I will stop here just by acknowledging um, the people in the lab who have worked on these animals um, for this study in particular, Tatiana ran the show and she did it with an undergraduate, Betsy Wen. Um, I have a lot of wonderful colleagues at uh, University of Toronto, um, Toledo, Bordeaux, at, and NIH. And um, I want to especially thank the, the funding that we've received for the lab from Safari, from CureGrin, and also from Canadian um, uh, agencies such as CIHR and, and CERC. So I will stop there. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramsey. So next we'll start our three minute uh, talks and we're gonna start first with Danielle, who's a PhD candidate in Dr. Karen Abraham's lab at um, Tel Aviv University. Okay, hi everyone. Um, can you see my screen and hear me okay? Perfect. Um, so one second. So hi, uh, I'm Danielle. I am a PhD candidate in Professor Karen Afram's lab. We're working on a Green 2D variant in collaboration with Dr. Moran Rubinstein. And uh, this variant is found in a small amount of patients worldwide and seemingly leads to the hyperexcitability of the NMD8 receptor. And now one of these patients is an Israeli child whose family works in close collaboration with our lab. Sorry. So my research focuses on answering essential questions six and seven, searching for optimal drugs to target NMDAs um, that can be repurposed for a grin disorder. So in order to do this, I'm working on various approaches, um, including a mouse model, a cellular model, and a computer model. Um, originally, our lab generated a CRISPR-Cas9 model that mimicked the patient's symptoms, as can be seen here with clasping and abnormal EEG recordings. However, this mouse model suffered from premature death and therefore we couldn't use it and are now working in collaboration with Dr. Wayne Frankel using a model generated by his lab. So um, we're currently treating these mice with a drug that inhibits an enzyme in the brain that breaks down cholesterol into a compound that positively regulates NMDRs. And uh, this drug has been shown to reduce seizures and premature death in a Dravet syndrome mouse model which is a similar development to an epileptic disorder. And this drug is currently in phase three of clinical trials in Gervais patients. 
Um, so we're investigating if this drug has a similar effect on the epileptic or developmental phenotype of our mouse model and uh, if it's translatable to GRIN patients. Um, additionally, we are developing a cellular model that expresses um, NMDRs containing variant GRIN2D. And we're going to use this model to perform high throughput drug screening um, with hundreds of FDA approved drugs in order to identify compounds that have an inhibitory function on variant green 2 d And we'll then measure these compound um, therapeutic abilities in the mouse model with our goal being to repurpose the drugs to treat green patients. Um, furthermore, we are generating a computer model of green one and green 2 d in order to understand the effect of this variant um, on NMDA's structure and to understand the molecular mechanism um, behind the patient's symptoms. Um, once we've finished creating this model, we'll then uh, screen a wide range of compounds to identify hit molecules that fit into the receptor pores and perhaps have an inhibitory function. And then these hits will be tested using our cellular and mice model to examine their therapeutic ability. So uh, to conclude, we're utilizing multiple methods in order to identify potential drugs that can be used to treat GRIN2D disorders and to further our understanding about this um, variance um, method of action. So thank you for listening. Um, I know that was very short. And I just want to thank everybody that's working on this project with me. Thank you so much, Danielle. So next we're gonna move on to Megan Sullivan, who's a PhD candidate in Dr. Amy Ramsey's lab at the University of Toronto. Uh, okay, can everyone see my slides and hear me okay? Yes. So hi everyone, my name is Megan Sullivan and I'm a PhD candidate in the lab of Dr. Amy Ramsey. And today I'm gonna to be giving my talk titled Characterization of GRIN1 Mouse Models. So first I want to talk about why mouse models are an important tool for studying GRIN1 disorder. So many cell-based techniques only give partial information on the functional consequences of these altered receptors in their functions. Um, and it's particularly difficult to make conclusions about how these altered receptors translate to function and activity within GRIN1 patients themselves. Therefore, our GRIN1 patient mouse lines allow us to work in vivo to test treatments in models highly representative of the patients. So we've characterized two mouse models, each harboring a specific GRIN1 patient variant. And the first is the Y647S heterozygous variant, which is carried by a patient with seizure and severe intellectual disability. And functional evaluation in vitro has shown it increases receptor activity. Therefore, uh, preliminarily, it is a gain of function variant. And then our GRIN1 Q536R heterozygous variant, which is carried by a patient presenting with mild intellectual disability, cortical visual impairment, attention deficits, and low muscle tone as an infant and functional evaluation has shown it decreases receptor activity. Therefore, preliminarily, it is a, a loss of function variant. So first, these mice were characterized electrophysiologically by our, collaborator, our collaborators, Sri Devi Venkatazan and Dr. Evelyn Lam. And when Bath and MDA was applied to coronal slices from these mice, the Y647S variant slices uh, showed a significantly larger current while in contrast, the Q536R variant slices produce less current compared to wild type. So this provided support um, in terms of our previous gain and loss of function classification for these variants. Next, I focused on behavioral characterization of these mice to see if they could model some of the symptoms we see in GRIN1 patients. And many of the GRIN1 patients display muscle tone abnormalities such as hypotonia. So the mice underwent a wire hang task, which is a measure of motor performance. So at three weeks old, the mice were placed on a wire cage top and the latency for them to fall to a container a small distance below was measured. And as you can see, there is no difference um, to, for latency to fall in terms of the Y647S heterozygous mice compared to wild type. But in contrast, the Q536R mice had a significantly reduced latency to fall, indicating a reduction in muscle tone. Lastly, we examine ultrasonic vocalization behavior in these mice. And ultrasonic vocalizations are a form of communication emitted by mice um, in different contexts. And the number and nature of these calls has been shown to change in other mouse models of neurodevelopmental disorders. So the hope here is that we might be able to study ultrasonic vocalizations in order to better understand the language deficits seen in GRIN1 disorder patients. So here, ultrasonic vocalizations were recorded in three three-week-old pups isolated from their mother. 
And you can see the Y647S heterozygous mice displayed significantly more calls in response to maternal isolation, whereas the Q536R mice displayed significantly less calls. So indicating that both of our mouse models display communication deficits that are different um, in infancy. So in conclusion, the Y647S and Q536R mice display varying behavioral phenotypes, and these appear to closely align with the patient symptomology. And this will ultimately allow us the opportunity to um, establish effective and differentiate medicines between gain and loss of function variants in GRIN1 disorder. Um, thank you for listening to my presentation, and here are my acknowledgments. Next talk is going to be from Jinyo Lee, who is a PhD student in Dr. Graham Collingridge's lab at the University of Toronto. All right, thanks, Megan. Uh, everyone can see the screen, and they're clicking it. Uh, so my name is Junior Lee. I'm a PhD student at Dr. Graham College at the uh, Department of Physiology and University of Toronto. Um, today, uh, because of quite a limited amount of time, that won't be talking about the data that we have, but instead I would like to introduce the work that is going on uh, related to the GRIN projects. Um, so for us, uh, we're mainly focusing on the G620R and G827R variants. And as you can see here, there's reported cases on missing variants in particular in the GLUN1 subunits. And I highlighted uh, the G620R variant with blue and the G827R as orange. And um, I'll show a very brief data in the following slide, but just to remind that most of the Figures that we show uh, will be marked blue with 620 and orange in the 827. So uh, to understand these variants in particular, uh, how this functionally affecting on the NMD receptor function, and ultimately as like an individual organism, uh, we generate this mice uh, using the genetic system uh, called CRISPR and mimicking the genetic variants identified from the children. And to understand this pathophysiology of both genetic variants on the gluon one more in depth, we're trying to hit it in four different angles, as you can see on the right side here. Um, so first, uh, we're using a synaptic physiological concept named electrical, uh, electric, electrophysiology. And as because the NMDA receptor resides in the synapses and it allows the currents going through, we try to um, measure these electrical activities going through the NMDA receptors and we're trying to characterize the biophysical properties and how that's been affected by this G620R variant or the G827R variants. And secondly, we're using a molecular biology or uh, biochemistry. We're measuring the protein expressions, uh, most likely the NMDA receptors, but not only them. Uh, we're also looking into the AMPA receptors and such other like scaffolding proteins where to see whether these variants are affecting the expression or the general concept of these synaptic structures. And also, uh, as third, we're examining the behavior of the mice for not only to validate these mice are recapitulating the symptoms that it's been identified from the patients, uh, but also in the future, like ultimately we can use this um, results to see whether these therapeutic strategies that we're trying to apply to can restore the deficits that has been showed from these either G620R or the G827R mice. And lastly, uh, we're conducting some of the anatomical analysis. Uh, so not only in the gross brain anatomy, but in the fine structures as well. So we're also looking into the hippocampus, like the size of the cell density and such others. And these kind of like brief introduction of the works that we are doing in the lab to understand these variants. And so far that we're getting it, it's just one simple figure that uh, using these electrophysiology uh, is clearly showing both of the G620R and G827R are showing a dramatic uh, loss of function in the NMJ receptors, nearly 50, like quantificationally 50% uh, in the G620R and 75% in the G827R. But it's quite interestingly that the reasons for why these variants are showing a, uh, a reduced current seems to be different. 
And the current hypothesis that we have based on the data that we have is that the G620R is able to reach in the sinus, but just like showing a compromised current. But uh, whereas in the GA27R, it's seemingly to having a deficit in the um, oligomerization of the NMDA receptor or in the trafficking deficits that is having a fewer receptors in the sinuses. Um, just a brief uh, introduction of the works that we're doing it. And just want to thank the people who's been related to the work, uh, specifically for the electrophysiology. And not shown here, but also Dr. Jonathan Thacker and Dr. Yes Lee is participating in the research. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. So next we have uh, Victoria from uh, University College London. Mm, hi, can everyone hear me? Oh, good. Yes, can I'm you see here. my slides? <laughs> I think you can, can you? Yes. Oh, perfect, okay. Um, so hi everyone um, and thank you for having me. My name is Victoria and I'm a final year MSci Pharmacology student at UCL. Um, so I've been undertaking a research project this year as part of my degree where I investigated the functional effects and drug sensitivity of recombinant AMPA receptors containing two different disease causing mutations. Um, but for this presentation, I will focus on the A643B mutation. Um, I'll further refer to it as the A2B mutation. So mutations in the GRIA2 gene, um, including the A2B mutation, um, coding for AMPARs have been linked to intellectual impairment, neurodevelopmental delays, and seizures. And our lab's previous work showed that the A2B mutants exhibited reduced desensitization and slow deactivation compared to wild type AMPARs, uh, which basically means that these receptors um, have longer channel openings, resulting in increased excitation of the brain. Um, so additionally, it was shown that a non-competitive AMPAR inhibitor, parampanol, had lower potency to inhibit um, A2B mutants compared to the wild type receptors. So this year, I employed fast glutamate application on outside-out patches from hex cells and investigated other non-competitive antagonists uh, with a hope to find a more optimal drug than parampanol. Um, decanoic acid and 4-BCCA were selected due to their binding site being further away uh, from the mutation site compared to parampanols. Also, decanoic acid can be given as a dietary supplement during the medium-chain um, triglyceride ketogenic diet and has been shown to be beneficial when reducing the seizure frequency. So on the second slide, um, we have decanoic acid results. And um, at the top, uh, we can see wild type AMPAR inhibition by one millimolar of decanoic acid. And for this batch, the inhibition was 9% of the maximum peak value. Um, however, the mean inhibition from three different batches was 29%. Um, at the bottom, um, we see the A to B mutant AMPAR inhibition. And for this particular patch, it was 30%. Um, so the mean inhibition from five different patches was 32%. Uh, so from my very initial results, I can see that decanoic acid seems to inhibit wild type and A2B AMPARs to a very similar extent, uh, which is good because its potency does not seem to be reduced in the mutants. So then next slide. Um, so uh, here we can see four BCCA results. Um, again, at the top, you see uh, selected wild type traces from the same patch. And here the wild type AMPAR inhibition by two millimolar of four BCCA was 46% of maximum peak value. And the mean inhibition from four different patches was also 46%. At the bottom, you can see the A to B mutant inhibition, um, which for this particular patch was 63%. Um, the mean inhibition from four different A to B patches was 50%. So four BCCA and decanoic acid seem to work on both type of AMPA receptors uh, with no reduced potency on the mutants. And the inhibition by four BCCA seems to be a bit higher than the decanoic acid. And then the last slide. Um, so overall, these results are quite promising, especially knowing that parampanol had reduced potency on the mutants. And in terms of decanoic acid, this also explains why ketogenic diet seems to be helpful uh, when prescribed alongside with parampanol. Um, so all this, of course, uh, requires repetition and a more in-depth analysis since I only now finished my data collection. 
Um, but in any case, thank you very much for your attention and time. And also thank you to our partners, the Medical Research Council. I think we had uh, one more presenter, but I don't see them yet on the call. Um, so in the meantime, we'll take questions. Megan, she's just joining right now. Oh, perfect. One second. We'll just wait for her to log on. Hi, Eliza. Hi. Hi, I'm here. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. I, don't, I just don't think I was uh, made a panelist, but um, I'm here and I'm ready. Perfect. Okay, if you want to go ahead and um, share your slides. Yeah, wonderful. I'll just start sharing my screen real quick and Great. get on with it. Cool. Let me just reacquaint myself with Zoom. It's been a while. <laughs> How do I close my presentation? I want my pass to the side and I find perfect. Cool. Hi. So my name is Elisa and I'm currently a researcher at the UCL Institute of Neurology. And I've been studying uh, pathogenic variants in GRIA 2 specifically. And I'm here to present to you some of the work that I've been doing on the flip-flop region of the GLUA2 um, because I believe that it might be a potential hotspot for uh, pathogenic variation, which requires uh, some looking into. Um, so I'm not going to give you guys the, the full details of the AMPA receptors because I'm sure we are all very familiar with them. But I do want to point out that the flip-flop region uh, is a specific part of the receptor, which is made around between 30 and 40 amino acids, um, and it's found within the ligand binding domain of the, um, of the receptor. And it is mainly involved in regulating uh, the kinetic properties of the AMPA receptor. So that mostly relates to desensitization and deactivation. And just in case we're not up to date, desensitization is when receptors close after long applications of glutamate and deactivation is when receptors close due to glutamate unbinding. So this region has a strong effect on kinetics and it's also developmentally regulated. And during my work at the Institute of Neurology, I took it upon myself to research as many databases as I could and the, literature, the published literature on GRIA2 variants. And I noticed that there seemed to be a bit of a pattern um, within uh, the identified variants and that the, this flip-flop region happened to have a surprising amount of variants. Uh, and none of them had been looked at using electrophysiology, which obviously is very important if we want to understand um, how these variants accept, accept, affect the receptor function to perhaps, you know, cause symptoms. Um, so overall, I found around seven of these. Uh, today, I'm going to present the results for just the one. Uh, this is the G792V mutation in the flip uh, cas cassette. Um, and I just have some details on the patient here, but as you can see, um, she is a young woman who has the sort of core symptoms of GRIA disorder or, you know, or these conditions, you know, like intellectual disability and autism spectrum disorder. Uh, she doesn't have any seizures, but, you know, that's how it is. So I've been studying this as well as Victoria in outside out patches from hex cells doing fast applications. So I'm gonna show you some of that data now. And on the top here, those two traces are long applications, long 100 millisecond applications with the aim of studying desensitization properties. And as you can sort of see from the spread of the data, they don't really seem to be changing very much. It is possible that there's an effect, but the data doesn't really support it. So it's possibly it's likely that this is not what is affecting the receptor to, to, to cause you know, the symptoms observed in this patient. However, if you look at the bottom two traces and the spread of the data for those two, you can see that when you do a very fast two millisecond glutamate pulse um, to assess deactivation, the change is almost tenfold. So once these receptors uh, see glutamate, it remains bound a lot longer and they pass a lot more current. So they are a lot more, they're active for a lot longer, passing a lot more signal, therefore they are overactive. And as you can see, the spread of this data is, is very conclusively <laughs> that these, um, the receptors with this variant really slow down the activation. 
Now, these are all the results I have to share with you today, but my plans are to um, pursue these type of experiments on the seven variants that I have so that I may better understand or that we as a community may better understand how uh, variants in this region affect receptor function to, to cause disease, uh, but also you know, to understand a bit more about the flip-flop region in itself. And I think this is particularly important because while we might know a lot about poor mutants, for example, or um, mutants in linker regions that have to do with pore opening, this is a more understudied area. So that's why I'm looking at it. And thank you very much. That's all I have to say. We have time for a couple of questions. Let's see if we have any in the chat that haven't been answered yet. It looks like the chat questions have been addressed. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or put them in the chat. Uh, so I do see a question here. Uh, is there anyone from University College London who is particularly interested in GRIA 2? Um, I'm currently working on GRIA 2. So uh, if you could share with me your email, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. And I'm sure um, my colleagues at the Department of Pharmacology would as well. Um, Perfect. So Thank you for that, Elisa email in the chat or something. I don't know if I have a way of easily seeing that. Sounds good. And I see that it looks like Jan had a hand up. Jan, did you have a question? All right, well, I don't see any more questions in the chat at this time. I wanted to take a moment to thank all of our speakers for the round robin of um, trying to present quickly and make sure we got everybody in. Um, so we're very happy that um, we were able to listen to all of your presentations today. Yeah.